Amazonia to Argentina. Okay, so we welcome everyone to this uh, colloquium. And as I was just browsing, uh, looking at my screen in the program before uh, we started now, I saw that the colloquium before ours uh, was themed uh, Tiempos de Crisis, uh, Times of Crisis. And we could, we could have called our presentation the same thing and we could say that it's just part two. This is season two of uh, Times of Crisis. I have this meeting is being recorded here. Uh, okay, so uh, what we wanted to share with you today, what we want to share with you today is, uh, is some ideas related to, to the environment. And it actually started with some conversations with Esther in a different way, and then with Christian and Jesus in Colombia a while back. Uh, okay, you see my screen is frozen. Uh, my screen is frozen. Can you? You you visible and and you moving? Yeah, but not the slides, right? Uh, not no. the slides. Maybe you need to click on the next slide. Uh, I'm clicking everything and nothing goes. It was the same thing last time with us. Yeah. Yes, try the space bar. No. Oh, I can't. No. Uh, you uh, have you only got one uh, one monitor, so you, you don't see the next slide. Yes, uh, I will have to switch the presentation to my iPad. So, uh, Esther, do you have the slides from yesterday? The, the problem is, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, no, no. Yeah, don't I worry, think. It's okay. uh, Try to try to get the uh, list of slides on the left hand side. Oh, what are you using for software? Uh, Keynote and Zoom. Uh, yeah, no. yeah Keynote. in Keynote, try to get the slides on the left hand side. But uh, I'm you sharing now. To click on the next slide. Oh, you mean you want me to share the split the screen? No, I want you to, what I suggest. <laughs> That's okay. You get this list of slides on the left-hand side, and then you should be able to point the cursor on it and click the next slide. No, it's, it, it, it just freezes. It's something beyond my control. Uh, can you see it like this? We can see you. No, not the slides. Esther, you have the slides on? Right. Sorry. Uh, yes, but somehow I only have one slide. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let me try again. But if they are the same of yesterday, I can just use that one. Okay. Let me try this. Does it work? Yes. Okay. We see the whole presentation, the, the, the whole program. Yes. Okay. Beautiful. So so the idea was it all started with discussions about sustainability, especially because I recently moved back to Amazonia. And I should tell you that I will not be using the English name Amazon because every time I say Amazon, I think of the company. So I need, we need to hide to uh, solve that little bit of linguistic challenge. So uh, since I came back to Amazonia, uh, the experiencing uh, the, the climate change and environmental crisis and the discourse of sustainability here is different because this is a place in Amazonia where sustainability started being talked about or being done in the 1980s. So it's a very important place in the discourse around uh, sustainability globally. So uh, what I'm showing you is an engram that I was doing some a little bit of research just to, sh to see when we started talking about sustainability. And that's actually very recent, just in the late, uh, from the mid 70s, and then it picks up in the 80s. So 
it, it matches with what are the impressions I had from this place and the whole discourse on sustainability and the problems with, with this terminology. And uh, Christian uh, brought this question to me a while back, which is the use of this uh, nominalization. So you, as we use this uh, nominalization, we end up uh, deleting uh, the participants. So we don't know actually who does sustainability and what we are actually sustaining. Because even though we have uh, an increase in the discourse of sustainability, we actually have an increase on climate change. So just for you to have a sense of uh, what we are talking about in material terms, and Christian will be talking more about this uh, later. We have, I was looking at yesterday at the deforestation rates in the legal Amazonia. Legal Amazonia is what we call in Brazil, the whole Brazilian Amazonia. So in the whole area from 1988 to 2021. So 1988 is a key year because this is when we had the new constitution and that was a game changer. We created offices to control the environment and we strengthened them. Uh, so through the 80s, the 90s, we have an increase that starts slowing down uh, from around 2004, it reaches a peak and then it goes down until uh, 2016. 2016 is the year uh, Dilma Rousseff was impeached. So after that, we have, we can see an increase that grow significantly with Bolsonaro. So this is uh, the map, uh, a, a graph for the, the, the states together. Later I will contextualize a little bit more, uh, but we can see here how the different states covered in the legal Amazonia, uh, they uh, have increased over the years and each one's contribution uh, to the, deforestation. So uh, what we have, what we plan to discuss here is that uh, while we have this discourse of sustainability, it's a semiotic activity that goes around in society, but it departs from uh, material systems from the first and the second order, and Christian will be developing on that. So I hand, in, uh, hand over to Christian. Should I just play the video clip? Or do you want to say anything before that, Christian? Uh, no, I think you can go ahead and, and play. And if there's questions afterwards, and you can okay. address them. But Thank are you, you okay? Um, yes, so far so good. Now okay. Yeah. And if, if, if there's a problem... Then... In Spain. Yeah. Loki and I have presented a talk based on our paper, Revisiting Halliday 1990, the role of linguistics in the study of the discourse of sustainability and how language shapes reality. This is part of the Mesa Coordinada with Francisco Veloso, our colleague and friend as coordinator. And this is where we are in the program. Now the scene we're concerned with can be characterized by a number of terms, crisis, collapse, crash, calamity, cataclysm, catastrophe, disaster, and so on. I pick these because I start with K. Collapse. Jared Diamond wrote a book on collapse that appeared a number of years ago. And we all have a sense of the calamity of collapse. We often get to a collapse step by step, incrementally, without being aware of the increments. And Malcolm Gladwell has discussed this in his book, The Tipping Point. But Jared Diamond wrote this book, Collapse, how society, societies choose to fail or survive. Note, note the systemic notion here. He also wrote a book, Upheaval, how nations cope with crisis and change. 
that the crisis of potential collapse we face is global climate change, global warming. We're all familiar with the different measures of this and the increase in the global temperature. And it's increasing in the news, as in this article from 2011 in Spanish, which fingers us, points to us humans as the main culprits. In his new ways of meaning, the challenge to find linguistics, Halliday talked, among other things, of the construal of common sense of folk knowledge. In his paper, he asked the question, what are the major upheavals in human history that seem to have been critical in what we might call semi history? A significant component in these historical upheavals, I'm suggesting, is a way, change in ways of meaning. But if different models of reality coexist within one language, what is to ensure that every group takes up the same set of options, construing their experience according to the same semantic priorities? And here the diversity around the styles of meaning, the meaning systems of different languages, and the cultures that they're embedded in is very, very important to take note of. In another paper, Language Evolving, Halliday says, one genre that has played an important part in the evolution of knowledge is narrative, in which preserved accounts of past or imaginary events are rehearsed in a more or less stylized and ritualized form. Events which encapsulate the accumulated experience of the community. Such narratives are instantial. Their particular protagonists have proper names, along with their own particular doings. Let me give you an example of a retelling of a traditional story for children. Noah's Ark, retelling of aspects of Genesis. One interesting thing to note in this picture book for children is how subliminally, clause by clause, a worldview is built up, a kind of cosmology. And that includes the potency of different participants. Who can do what to whom? Who can say what to whom? So God speaks to Noah, for example, and Noah to his family, conveying the message from God. And Noah and his sons act on the world within their domain, cutting down trees, for example, chopping and sawing them. So this, in a sense, naturalizes what on an industrial scale is now threatening the lands of our planet. There's an article from New Scientist, 2014. Your shopping comes from illegally deforested land. So chopping and shopping may be connected. Clause by clause, subliminally, as I suggested, a Old Testament cosmology is built up with God as creator, destroyer of cosmos. The cosmology is geocentric and patriarchal. There's a kind of fractal pattern here on different scales. Semantics, in terms of potency, God controls natural forces. And they control the rest of creation. Within humans, men as patriarchs, including then Noah and his sons, control women and non humans. And in material clauses, then, actor, they serve as actor with potential goals. So this is built up clause by clause in the lexical grammar. This is a very traditional worldview and one of the kind that Michael Halliday suggests can lead us astray in thinking about the way the world is and how we operate in it and how we impact it. There is an alternative, Gaia theory or hypothesis of paradigm, might also be called feedback loop theory. And this has various by now well-known properties 
And we can locate this within the hierarchy of systems operating in different phenomenal realms, physical, biological, social, and semiotic. And we can identify the different factors that lead, uh, are leading to this or have led to this environmental crisis, climate change, global warming. So we have material factors, the Gaia phenomenon, how Gaia is changing, the different spheres within Gaia, biological sphere, biosphere, the physical spheres, lithosphere, uh, cryosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere. And then supplementing this, we need to consider immaterial factors. But just a quick note on the background to the term Gaia. When, when I first saw the theory of the self regulated system, it was in 1965, over 40 years, years ago. And uh, it's slowly evolved in my mind over the next uh, couple of years or so. And uh, I used to live in those days in Wiltshire, in the village of Babachor. And then the near neighbor of mine was the famous novelist, William Gogol, who subsequently got a Nobel Prize in Brighton. And he was a close friend of mine, and we used to walk to walk to the village shop, uh, to get and he would do a quiz about what I was doing in science, because he was very interested in science, and I told him about this idea of the and he said, you better give it a proper name, two figures here in just some scientific acronyms and like that. So, so I, I suggested Gaia. And that was a good suggestion in many respects. We need accounts of immaterial phenomena, social semiotic, and in some sense resonate with and supplement the increasingly embraced Gaia theory or hypothesis paradigm. And here, the alternative to the traditional mechanistic or Cartesian approach to the study investigation of phenomena, holistic web of life approach uh, described in various book, uh, books by Frater Kapper, for example, in general systems theory and so on. In this book from 2014, the systems view of life, a unifying vision. And in addition, the quite recent book by David Greber and David Wengrow, The Dawn of Everything, A New History of Humanity, is very important because it gives us a sense of the so social synodic diversity throughout human history. What this book suggests is the traditional linear view of human history. So it's not a, is wrong. So it's not a linear succession of evolutionary stages as previously claimed in big history, but rather simultaneous systems of choice. For example, choices in mode of subsistence, degree of hierarchy, division of labor, provenance, and so on. And they suggest in the conclusion, the evidence we have from Paleolithic times onwards suggests that many, perhaps even most, people did not merely imagine or enact different social orders at different times of the year, but actually lived in them for extended periods of time. The contrast with our present situation could not be more stark. Nowadays, most of us find it increasingly difficult even to picture what an alternative economy or social order would be like. Our distant ancestors, by contrast, to have moved regularly back and forth. So the important point from our current concerns in this, in this uh, context is the ability to imagine different ways of engaging with our material environment as well as our immaterial environment. Thus, we are free to imagine and implement social systems that are much more resonant with Gaia, foregrounding collaboration rather than competition as custodians of the planet rather than exploiters. Now, what we've done in systemic functional linguistics is, I would say, a subset of a general systems view of life, a web of life. So in conclusion, over to Lockheed. Lockheed will continue to present aspects of our research into 
30 years after Halliday 1990. Thank you very much, Christian. Lucky, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Thank you, uh, Francisco. Thank you, Christian. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Fantastic, fantastic. So uh, can I share my screen, if that's all right? Yes, I'm trying okay, to. Okay, great. It's okay. I. Okay. Am I taking over? Yes, please do. Okay, and uh, I just in case, I'm just going to click one slide so that, can you all see that it's moving? Is it changing? Okay, great, yes, fantastic. Yes. So thank you, thank you. All right, so uh, in the next eight minutes, I will quickly speed up <laughs> and cover the parts of the research that Christian and I have been working on. Um, so here we go. Basically, we started this, uh, the Revisiting Halliday project um, back in 1999, because we thought it would make a great 30 years um, of a roundup after Halliday um, seminal paper 1990. So we have two research questions, uh, very simple. The first one is uh, what has changed in climate talk since Halliday 1990? And the second one, we'll come back. So um, we have three observations. Uh, the first one is that the limitless, uh, limitless resources that Halliday talked about um, back in 1990 in English grammar still exists today. So as a recap, we have uh, Halliday's quote on the left. Uh, our grammar construes air and water and soil and also coal and iron and oil as unbounded, that is, as existing without limits. But the grammar presents them as if the only source of restriction was the way that uh, we ourselves quantified them, as if they in themselves were inexhaustible. So in uh, 2019, we have uh, Professor Jane Godall, who said the following. Okay, sorry, I need to share. Some. So one more time. That we can have, un and it's crazy to think that we can have unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources and a still growing human population. It, something's got to give. All right, I hope the sound came out okay. Uh, if not, then here's a meme that I created, basically just the quote that she has just made. Okay, and uh, next, our second observation was uh, the psychological inertia, or also known as the, bro the boiling frog, it's still very much affecting us. So going to the holiday again, um, who said that human beings are good at recognizing and responding to sudden catastrophic changes, but bad at recognizing and admitting it to themselves what he calls slow notion crisis, formed by gradual trends and shifts of probabilities. In uh, 2019, um, um, an article on the Guardians, basically, uh, by Christensen, who was working on a report by or on the person now called um, Frank Luntz. And we'll hear more about this person again. But anyway, he was a consultant for the Republican candidates. So uh, here is his quote. Republican candidates express their sincerity and concern about the environment, but he also wanted them to downplay concerns. Using focus groups, Luntz discovered that climate change sounds less frightening than global warming. While global warming has catastrophic connotation attached to it, climate change suggests a more controllable and less emotional challenge, which therefore means it's just not much of change um, 30 years. Uh, the last observation that we have, or maybe not the last, but the third one, uh, is the emergence of discourse of climate crisis instead of climate change. So we know uh, Glada from Bay, who uses metaphors uh, of like this one, I want you I want you to act as if the house was on fire. We have AOC and talking about uh, climate change as well with her usual um, metaphors and, 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 and yeah uh, and, and sort of slight aggressions if you if you would like. Uh, and also Sir David Ottenberg also you know addressing the importance of showing uh, wildlife loss on television. Uh, so these are the the emergence of the discourse of climate crisis. Uh, here comes our second research question. So if we, linguists and language education, uh, 
language educators, sorry, want to save our planet, uh, what still needs to be done? So in our research, we have come up with four domains um, for this approach to climate talk in the 2020s. And we have um, the following four. So number one is accuracy of information and belief in information. Right, we'll come back to the other three later on. Uh, so what does that mean by accuracy of information and belief in information? Believe it. We can observe some responsiveness if we give people information, but it doesn't seem to be enough to make these misperceptions go away. There are a couple of big reasons why this happens. One is there's a high cost to accepting evidence that contradicts our beliefs. It might be psychologically threatening to us to admit that we're wrong. It's costly just to say I was wrong. That's hard for me. That's hard for anybody. We'd all like to think we're dispassionate, but as human beings, we're all skeptical of information that seems to contradict some existing value or belief or attitude that we have. And so we can be un unduly skeptical of that information that is unwelcome. That defensiveness is even stronger when a false belief is linked to a political party or president. If you identify as a Republican and a fact checker tells you a Republican belief is wrong, you're more likely to reject the fact check. Fox and Friends starts right Okay, so what this actually clip is talking about, basically, it's why fact check isn't working uh, on a lot of people. So there are a lot of um, skeptics or, or, or discussions on you know climate change not being real or not being uh, human uh, caused by human and this would be one of the reasons why um, the accuracy of information is important so um, knowing or understanding how misinformation spreads it's uh, and why it's resistant to fact checking can actually raise our interest uh, our awareness of the accuracy of information we receive and then help us think more critically but as teachers or as applied linguists, okay, what we can do with our expertise in, say, discourse analysis is there to detect falsehood or bias and then be proactive about promoting these accurate information so that you know, we may be able to slow down the spread of the misinformation and as well as to educate our future uh, generations. Uh, number two, it's the exposure to accurate information or fact. And we have the next video. Or right, oh, before that, we may need to look for uh, alternative channels such as the social media as outlets of our voices, because um, we linguists, we apply linguists, we teachers, we, are, from my understanding, we're not very active in in talking about uh, what is what is what is the accurate information about about climate change or or, or Gaia theory, for example. That's something I learned from um, from Francisco. Um, so I thought that was a, make a really good point that we do need to promote more. Uh, so what may what we may want to employ uh, some strategies other than plainly repeating uh, post exposure fact checks. So one of the linguistic strategies is the use of satire. Of that story. But this is bigger than debunking any one conspiracy theory. Satire is powerful because it trains your brain to be skeptical, to think critically about what politicians are saying. He's using your words when you use the words and he uses them back it's circular using of the word and that's from you political satire is about showing you that the system is faking you out it's kind of opening your eyes to basically lying yeah that's a guy who's definitely lying it fires up the mind to say hmm this doesn't seem right okay so that's very much also related to climate change another one is uh it's simply repeating the facts, but not just repeating the specific false claims when delivering such fact checks. And at the same time, numbers, frequencies do matter. Here comes our second video. Oops, sorry. Maybe I just click that. To that story. But this is Last bigger than debunking. presents a statistically representative climate change debate. Good evening. Joining me tonight, a climate change denier and, naturally, Bill Nye Science Guy. Uh, so, Bill. Bill? John? Yep. Humans are causing climate change? No wait, question. Wait, 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 wait. Before we begin, on, in the interest of mathematical balance, I'm going to bring out two people who agree with you, climate skeptic. And Bill Nye, I'm also going to bring out 96 other scientists. Uh, it's a little unwieldy, but this is the only way we can actually have a representative discussion. Uh, so, yeah, please, please file in. Again, again, this is, this is going to make the debate difficult. We shouldn't really be having it in the first place. But, uh, so... 
representationally, climate skeptic, please make a case against climate change. Well, I just don't think all the science is in yet. It's settled. OK, and what is the overwhelming view of the entire scientific community? Well... <laughs> OK, OK. Right, so we're, we're ending this video here. But you get what I mean. That numbers do matter because it has to be reputational. So very quickly, we're going to go into the third one. Engineering of the Lexus of Climate Change Discourse. Uh, this is brought by the Guardian because they initiated this change in their Lexus uh, or, or the style guide that they use um, back in 2019. So the Guardian has updated the style guide to introduce terms more accurately describing the uh, environmental crisis facing the world. So instead of climate change, they use terms like climate emergency, climate crisis, climate breakdown. Uh, global heating is favored over climate warming or global warming. Finally, it comes to our last one. It's the psychological barriers to believe in accurate information. So why is it so difficult for um, us or others to this believe in climate change? Gloom messaging just isn't working. We seem to want to tune it out. And this fear, this guilt, we know from psychology is not conducive to engagement. It's, it's rather the opposite. It makes people passive because when I feel fearful or guiltful, I will withdraw from the issue and I'll try to think about something else that makes me feel better. And with a problem this overwhelming, it's pretty easy to just turn away and kick the can down the road. Somebody else can deal with it. So it's no... All right, uh, so to cut short, what we can do is that we can't just be... It can't just be a guilt trip about pole, dying polar bears or driving around in gas gasolers. Uh, we need to talk about our wins as well. So, for example, like how do we earn, how do we improve by saving energy use, and so on and so forth. So the positive, uh, wonder that the positivity in it. So if we uh, put all these four domains into our best friend, context, field, mode, tenor, and uh, language, we can see that this is how they are positioned. And finally, well, just a quick recap of what Halliday's emissions and uh, vision for us. So uh, our reality is not something ready made and waiting to be meant. It has to be actively construed. Language has the power to shape our consciousness. Applied linguists are creating an active force which will play its part in shaping people's consciousness and influencing the direction of social change. Finally, I'm ending this uh, presentation with, um, you know, Lunds again, because if you recall, uh, he, he was the person who promoted the, the term climate change to the uh, politicians. And uh, so 18 years later, he in, in 2019, he admitted that he was wrong. So he went on to try to do something to redeem himself by changing terms, uh, terms to use on the left, you know, which charts and terms to uh, words to lose on the right side. What this actually tells us is the following thing. The reality, or at least the one we discussed here, appears to be that we continue to sit back, cross our arms and roll out our eyes. Someone else has been more than happy to do our jobs. So hopefully that will be some fruitful thought. Um, and if you would like to read more about uh, the whole, our whole study, it's, um, it, our paper is actually on ResearchGate. It's uh, being reviewed by a journal now. Uh, hopefully it will be out soon. But uh, if you're interested, you can read it from um, our ResearchGate account. Uh, thank you very much. Everybody, that's it. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lock. Thank you very much. Now we'll go ahead with Dr. Estelina Nervino, uh, and then we have all the questions uh, at the end, and then we can discuss. Okay, thank you, Esther. Okay, um, my slides are moving, right? Yes. Um, well, hello everyone. Um, I know we are all on different time zones uh, in Hong Kong. Fifteen PM. Um, the presentation I'm going to uh, give today it actually looks at the reaction of some of um, the people that are talking about climate change and related crisis. The title of my presentation is Sion Carbon Neutral Challenge, which is an Instagram challenge launched by one CEO working on, in the luxury industry that actually wanted to somehow instill 
this uh, idea that uh, companies in primis are responsible for what is happening and therefore they have the responsibility to act upon it. Uh, I will give an introduction and walk you through the research background of this study. Then we'll share uh, about the methodology and then findings and discussion before I move to the conclusion. Uh, the idea of working on this specific open letter came from the fact that while collecting data from 2019 till 2022 for a bigger project that looks at how luxury brands have been discussing uh, topics related to sustainability in the environmental, social and governance aspect on social media, which is something quite new that wasn't actually done before 2018. Uh, this open letter, which actually classifies also as a new hybrid genre to investigate, uh, starts by saying that as businesses, we all have the responsibility to meet the reality of our global climate and biodiversity crisis head on and find solutions that can amplify the efforts to conserve and restore nature while mitigating climate change. Um, the idea of working on luxury follows up, follows up on different studies I conducted earlier on branding. And nowadays, sustainability comes in as one of the key elements of this um, luxury concept, even though, as you can see, it actually clashes with the conventional definition of luxury that poses um, questions about this idea of having one concept always recognized as overconsumption, now trying to blend within sustainability, which actually focuses on conscious consumption. And at the same time, on the social aspect of this definition, we have luxury actually created to define this social stratification that now needs to blend to sustainability that actually advocates for social equality. Uh, so in the literature, that I've been reviewing in business, we find all this tendency of luxury being uh, overconsumption and social stratification. And then in the media nowadays, these uh, luxury brands trying to advocate for the way that they can actually create social equality and make the world a better place. Uh, we have seen the uh, use of different uh, titles in the media looking at the sustainability transformation that these brands are uh, actually uh, presenting. And at the same time, we see that whatever was, this, was described as luxurious is now actually described as sustainable. Uh, the particular study that I'm presenting today actually focuses on um, this challenge launched as part of a bigger project of one brand, uh, Gucci, uh, and Gucci itself is part of a group that rebranded itself in 2013 to actually share their new attitude of caring about the world. So here it comes to our mind in which way this course has been used to actually change the perception of luxury and mitigate this idea that uh, actually there is social stratification or overconsumption linked to that. Um, one observation to make is that in uh, this course, there is also this uh, confusion or better this use of terms that are used interchangeably, while uh, particularly this year with the issue of new regulations, they are actually being uh, differentiated. So sometimes we would see uh, sustainability, some other times corporate social responsibility to indicate those activities planned by those companies. And more recently, ESG, because it's more measurable and actually it's what even uh, the financial sector is looking at. In terms of research background, I had previously worked on analyzing sustainability, sustainability reporting. Um, the, the findings from previous studies, they actually showed that companies were still looking at their effort as a romanticized narrative about what they are doing to save the world and somehow multimodal construction of brands blending within uh, this idea of green and sustainable. Uh, at the same time, as mentioned earlier, only in 2018, we start seeing uh, social media posts uh, proliferating on 
actually those brands' accounts to explain how those brands were actually engaging with sustainability and somehow this change in audience, so from reporting to shareholders to actually um, exposing themselves to consumers with green, green claims or social claims was actually something new started by Stella McCartney. Uh, the aim of the study is uh, to examine this collective discourse that actually has been produced and distributed in relation to this specific letter that I, um, I'm going to analyze for you. And uh, I've developed three research, four research questions that will guide uh, the presentation for today. First of all, I will be presenting the discursive features that are actually used in this open letter that actually aimed at launching this collective initiative. The second one uh, focuses on the response to the letter that actually was triggered on an Instagram account. So not the usual communication tool for CEO or senior, senior management. The third one is um, how is actually this brand resemiotizing this letter? So moving from one platform to another to actually engage different types of audience. And the fourth one, what are the different semiotic resources that are involved in the construction of this discourse on Instagram? Um, without going too much into detail, uh, applying social semiotics, I also would like to highlight that um, in the analysis of this, this discourse, besides looking at the social, uh, of the semiotic perspective and uh, the social institutional perspective, I also very much looked at the brand agenda behind uh, the creation of this discourse. Uh, in terms of data collection, the uh, study includes one open letter and 33 Instagram posts, which actually are the only ones available in relation to this specific letter. Um, it has been collected as aggregated discourse posted by uh, different accounts, including Gucci itself. You can see an image of the letter here. So shared by Marco Bizzarri, the CEO through press release, and then uh, taken by media to other platforms, and then the brand itself using their own accounts, both Gucci account and the Gucci Equilibrium project account to disseminate it. Uh, it's a qualitative study. Step one was to analyze the lecture by using uh, the Aristotle triangle to understand how persuasion was built through ethos, pathos, and logos, and also looking at more uh, the interactional meta discourse proposed by Highland. Step two actually moved to another medium, which is Instagram, where um, I collected all the posts related to this letter and applied a multi-framework that I developed for my PhD thesis, which is an unpublished work at the moment in 2018. I looked at the medium specific features, including hashtags and links, I applied transitivity system to look at how language was used into these posts. And then in terms of visual analysis, I applied Crest and Van Luen, then moved to uh, intersemiotic relations and the registrial cartography. In terms of open letter, there is actually a balance between ethos, pathos, and logos. And here you can see uh, some examples of those statements. So in terms of pathos, this idea that all companies have this responsibility because there is a call to conserve and restore nature. Ethos, because there are some um, external institutions mentioned in order to um, somehow recall intertextually what, uh, what other CEOs would be aware of. And then Logos, building somehow these consequences through um, facts and figures. If we look at the meta discourse, we have a series of interactive resources that are transitions, that are evidentials and code uh, glosses that actually want to highlight how the discourse of the lecture is aligned to other discourses that the other managers will be exposed to. In terms of interactional resources, uh, there is a high frequency of boosters, attitude markers, engagements, and self mentions. Particularly for self mentions, there is the use of uh, first 
person pronouns in terms of we um, sometimes the we will be inclusive so referring to all of us some others will actually be exclusive referring to the brand itself but some other times will there will be actually an even more exclusive use of we which actually refers only to the senior management uh, in terms of um, this dialogue built through uh, Instagram post, you see that the highest frequency is actually related to interaction resources, and we see that the construction of, provided by lang linguistic features here, it actually creates this idea of leadership, but a leadership by association to the one who started. Uh, if we look at um, the Instagram posts themselves by looking at the hashtag we can that works as an aggregator. We can see that all the posts are actually 12% um, from Gucci, 17% by Gucci Equilibrium. So there is a sort of self-mention. Uh, CEO's engagement results in 18%. There is media that actually uh, reposts uh, the post. So it accounts for the 23rd. 3%, businesses 15%, individual 12%, and some undefined for 3%. Uh, in terms of uh, hashtags, we can see that only 16 posts out of 33 actually use this um, device to aggregate their own discourse. You can see that most of them are actually used by uh, to include Gucci into the discourse, even if they are not the one posting. If we think of the visual analysis, we see that color works as a cohesive uh, device. We have different shades of green and nature inspired images. Here I have one example that actually reminds us of Italy is San Pellegrino is an Italian company. But the second one, for instance, posted by Cartier, actually has an image that somehow recalls the Amazon forest. And at the same time, uh, in terms of branding, we see what I was mentioning earlier, this idea of romanticizing the nature that is always present, particularly in this type of segment. Uh, while the images rely on the collective imaginary that we have of environmental issues, if we think of um, other types of images that are used, as I mentioned earlier, there is a very strong construction of self mentions for the brand who launched the um, activity. So in terms of static images, we have a majority of static images, as I mentioned, but also images that actually will link later to a video for one occurrence. We see that in terms of representational meanings, we have in terms of participants, the CEOs who joined this activity, and then some images that actually report a tagline. Uh, processes are mainly conceptual processes. And in terms of circumstances, we can see that they are usually business setting or nature environment that we configure into the images. Uh, in terms of compositional meanings, the focus was more on how those uh, posts are linked and related to each other, so building a cohesion. And usually the focus of the post is always placed at the center. Um, in terms of captions, we see that in transitivity analysis, we have a majority instead of uh, narrative processes, material processes that actually tend to state um, when a specific brand is saying is um, is doing something to join the activity. In terms of participants, uh, reflecting what actually was also in the open letter, we have the presence of we, we all, and we as CEOs. Uh, and sometimes there would be uh, the use of the brand itself. In terms of circumstances, we have actually spread across the different Instagram posts, time, space, uh, cause, and accompaniment. In terms of social semiotic processes, uh, reporting, sharing, and recommending, which is actually different from findings from another study about branding and product uh, promotion that actually will include a different variety of social semiotic processes. Mm, we can see that then Gucci uh, CEO is the leading voice that actually initiates all these activities, raise the awareness, and recognize the efforts of the other ones involved. 
In terms of conclusion, uh, open letter, there is a focus on interactional discourse, and the dialogue itself is built through the same discursive device that are actually used to create this leadership by association. Um, then we have uh, in uh, the Instagram post, uh, overall, we see that the narrative is uh, built through ethos, and then it is a CEO's conversation, and the dialogue actually it's built to remain between them with no inclusion of the rest of the community. Some instances of the we, we see that may involve the employees and the company, but somehow here it's still a way of rebuilding this exclusivity proper, proper of luxury. Um, Gucci CEO frames himself as the leading voice to actually initiate uh, this activity. And at the same time, this is a narrative that continues throughout the post. And at the same time, it is a collective call that, but the agency is limited to the initiator. The mm, main text of reference is always the open letter. And this actually makes the language, the mode carrying extended information, drawing upon the original text. The narrative constructed through uh, Instagram uh, actually deploys medium specific features that are mainly self-referential and focus on the positioning of the brand. These are the uh, selected references. Ah, sorry. I missed this slide. Just to conclude, um, probably the choice of the medium, medium may be the reason why uh, this particular text actually remains uh, collecting very few posts. At the same time, there is this idea of making the conversation about senior management, but is Instagram the right place to do so? It appears that this activity is more to raise awareness of the activities that there are behind the scenes that consumer may not be aware. Um, this is part of a larger uh, project and uh, it actually will develop into an analysis of open letter as a hybrid genre. And it leads us to this idea that probably sustainability which is being um, shared as a topic of interest of everyone, while in this type of discourse, it, team, it seems that companies, CEOs, and senior management in, in general are the one responsible to act upon this crisis. Thank you very much, and I'll come back later for the questions. Thank you, Esther. Thank you very, very much for your uh, for sharing your research with us. So uh, one thing, both Christian Lockie and uh, Esther, they have been they have been sharing with us about meanings, okay, about uh, immaterial uh, order of systems, uh, to use Christian's uh, terminology. So what I want to do with you, I want to share with you, because one thing Astra said is about this uh, romanticization of sustainability of the environment. And because I actually was born and grew up in Amazonia, throughout the years as I started getting exposed to these different discourses, uh, I was always wondering, but this is not, there's no romance in that, okay? So, uh, especially because here we have lots of ecologists, of course, so biology, this area is very strong here. Uh, research on the forest. And it, there is a little bit more, it's more challenging to do work with indigenous groups, uh, indigenous languages. It's, it's starting to grow now, but it's still very, uh in the beginning so what i want to share with you is a little bit about uh practical uh, not practical but some more uh material issues that actually are related to all these immaterial semiotic issues uh so uh, I titled, uh, I, I thought at first that I would just focus on the indigenous people, but then because life is so hectic 
in Brazil right now with the elections and indigenous people and the people in the forest, uh, I decided to make some changes. And the data for this presentation, I used this a while back with Professor Tom Bartlett in Glasgow and, me, and that event on communication and sustainability is the thing that actually uh, dragged me back into this topic together with Esther. Uh, and uh, this is a, a, a small research project I had in the early 2000s after the PhD. Uh, and actually it was in the beginning, uh, sort of a break from my PhD research on linguistics and comics. And then I decided to focus on what was happening here. And then we had a government from 1999 to 2007 that it was the first uh, label party government here. So that was before Lula was elected in 2002. And so we had a label party uh, government here, but not at the federal level from the beginning. So what this government did different from all the others was to understand that we are actually right in the middle of the Amazonia forest. And I have been discussing with friends here from uh, forestry engineering and everybody, we all have agree on something. People hate the forest in the sense that people don't like living in the forest. Everybody dreams of, for example, in Brazil, I usually say that uh, the, the, the middle class dream here is to move to the Northeast go to the beach. The beach is the place to be, the, the beach is the place to rest. So the forest is a nuisance. Uh, uh, recently we had election for governor and one of the candidates, he's actually a senator and he was very important last year on the Bolsonaro's government. What he was saying on TV during the debate was explicitly saying, uh, you know, preserving the forest is holding us back in terms of growth. And so there is this idea that we need to deforest so that we can actually have development. So the associate, the discourse associates deforesting, deforesting with, uh, with development. So uh, what this government did different was first to understand a little bit and recover a bit of our history because Acre is a state the size of Portugal, around the size of Portugal, which has 10 million people. And this state has about 800 people, uh, 800,000 people, sorry. Not even a, a million people scattered around Portugal. Just imagine that. So there's a lot of forest here. The, 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 this land belonged to Bolivia until 1904. And when it was officially incorporated to Brazil, and we have a, a few key players in this process. In 1920, we have the first uh, brick buildings being constructed. Until then, it was just wood. And so Gover Governor Hugo Carneiro, he made lots of changes to the city. And then we have the military coup in 1964. And from 1980s, we start having the what is called impact, which is literally means a tie. So this, uh, these movements in the forest, they were led by Chico Mendes. He was not an environmental leader. He was a person living in the forest, defending their uh, ways of living, you know? Uh, and they understood that if you destroy the forest, we don't have what to eat and where to live. And this ties, they consisted pretty much when the bulldozers uh, entered the forest, they would stand in front of bulldozers and chains, uh, chainsaws and all, just, hug, uh, just hug around a tree, a group of people, because some of these, these trees, they require five, 10 people to circle them. So they were really in between putting their bodies in front of these machines. So this is what led 
in the 80s to Chico Mendes becoming a symbol of this resistance. It's really important. And nowadays there is a strong discourse in trying to, to deconstruct Chico Mendes uh, symbolism of this fight. Not understanding that actually these people who become, a, a, well, people don't quite understand what, what it means to say that he's a symbol and as a person they have, we all have uh, faults. So they usually focus on the negative aspects, try to diminish uh, their importance. So 1988, Chico Mendes is assassinated. So what happens here then is that with this government uh, from 1999, they start recovering the history and trying to, uh, to foster a sense of belonging with the forest. So this is a map of the legal forest. And this is where Acre is. Okay, so the size of Portugal. And this is the contribution of Acre, uh, the state of Acre to deforestation. So in the previous slide, I was showing you all the states. Uh, so we, we couldn't really see what was happening there. Uh, separating with, with the states. So uh, there are some key points. You have two uh, years that are that stand very high uh, peak years. This is 1995 and then 2003. What is interesting is that uh, after uh, the Labour Party took over here, they started their government, we have some control, but in 2001, 2002, this is the final years of uh, F. A. Fernando Henrique Cardoso and the transition between him and Lula and the Labour Party, it, it's just like now, since the election, uh, deforestation and burning of forests has increased since October now, like 1,200% because Bolsonaro lost. So people just rush to destroy as much as they can because once it is destroyed, there's not much that can be done. And usually these lands, they already belong to people. So uh, the current, that government, they explored the idea of identities, but they also understood the fact that identities, they are, they are they don't exist only outside as representation, but inside in that we need to, uh, to identify ourselves with that. So it requires material and symbolic resources to develop and sustain this notion of identity that needs to be, uh, I would say now it needs to be rebuilt. So identities arise in the imaginary, and this is what they started playing. This is, I will show you some of the material produced in this period. Like this one, it was, it's a big brochure for tourists that says Acre is our place in the world. Uh, with that government, they were trying to show that action because here there is a strong discourse of isolation. We are actually isolated. There is only one road that leads the state to the rest of Brazil. There are flights, flights are extremely expensive now. So we are very much isolated with all the Bolsonaro, after Bolsonaro lost, they have blocked this one road uh, that links us to the, to the rest of the country. And we ran out of gas in here, in the city in the last two days. So we are trying not to drive because this Protesters are blocking roads, trying to secure uh, a forced victory to Bolsonaro. So they start. They started first of all uh, changing architecture. For example, they built this beautiful bridge in the city center, and there was the discourse: "We don't need this bridge. We don't need this bridge." And then I, I, I was a person to argue and say, "Okay, if you go to Paris, they have like two hundred bridges, and you're gonna take pictures in all of them." Or if you go to Prague, so why can't we have, a, actually, we, we need the bridge and why can't it be nice and different, you know? So there is value, uh, trying to build value in that and also trying to build value in, uh, in craftsmanship from indigenous group. You will see some of the, this indigenous motives, they will, they will move from uh, ceramics, pottery, for example, into architecture, I will show you some of this. So 
they start talking about the revolution, which is the, the, the short, small war conflict, armed conflict we had with Bolivia early in the 1900s. Uh, the House of Shipmans became uh, sort of a museum. Uh, this blue uh, Chevy house uh, is where he lived. And this is where he died just in front of this house. It's a very interesting place and it gives us a sense of the real thing. It's not just a scam, but somebody who was just like us and he, he really made history in that sense. So it shows, a, it, it brings us a little bit more about, uh, it's very illustrative of agentivity. So in this discourse, they started also uh, fighting against the idea of isolation, say, okay, uh, we are not isolated in the world. We are just, you know, uh, driving distance from Machu Picchu, for example. We are driving distance from Peru and Bolivia. So we are not really isolated. Well, that is not really easy because we have the Andes in between. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a very difficult reason, uh, uh, region. So uh, you see in these squares, uh, on the left, the, the square, on the right, the square was uh, refurbished. Uh, rebuilt completely. So between the 1960s and 2009, this square had many different faces and it was changed completely in the 70s. In the, 90, in the early 2000s, they brought it back to the original uh, architecture, but they now, we can see on the tiles, uh, indigenous uh, motifs, on the tiles, so they started becoming part of everyday life. So yes, we are in the middle of the forest. Yes, we have indigenous people here and we live to uh, embrace it, this idea, but also fostering this idea. So this is what a particular year that in 2008, when suddenly the city was flooded with, uh, with billboards celebrating the Indigenous People Day, which is in April. So he was celebrating uh, the culture and the difference. And he was very visible everywhere. So he was really uh, in a, a clear uh, attempt to explore all these semiotic resources to try to, to put the pe people in this place. Because if we don't like this place, why should we preserve it? Why should we keep it that way? And how can we can actually uh, find new ways for people to live off the forest without destroying it? Because that is the big challenge here. So, and they also you always use this idea of, there's not much we can do with the standing. So the timber is more valuable, for example. So they have used the, the use, they have used local symbols in design and architecture to foster this sense of belonging, high appreciation of local food as well, effacement uh, and resign, resignification of history, sort of replacing Plaza de Castro as the hero of that armed conflict in the early 1900s, consolidating Chico Mendes as a historical figure, giving him the name of an avenue that now is being threatened to be changed again, removing his name. So it's really about deleting history, facing history, publication of books, brochures, and architecture, pins, keychains, all this uh, material resources they were actually carrying all these immaterial resources along with them because of what they used. But then the key thing that I think they came up with was in the middle of their government, one of their journalists came up with the concept of forest ship in Portuguese, florestania, which means we are people from the forest. So we are citizens from the forest. So they came up with this uh, now new now a forest ship that was wisely and widely used within that period, and that has also disappeared, as uh, because it became also some sort of branding of a political party. So 
uh, they came up with different uh, material, always exploring the notion of forest ship and this is where we are, these are our things. And through picture and text, uh, if pictures they are valuing and enhancing the beauty, the different types of beauty of the place, uh, language was being used to sort of place places in history and put people in place like after she comments that the discourse sustainable development gained traction in the use of forest management techniques which is something that actually happened in that period so they embraced this identity and we can relate this uh to jose luis moiter he was once a member of our group uh, I hope some of you still remember him. And Moiter came up with the, uh, was working just before he passed away. He was working with Anthony Giddens uh, structuration theory. And his uh, argument was th is that we could use as a tool to discuss the context of culture, to have uh, some more uh, tangible categories to deal with it. So what we can see in this kind of, uh, in, in this challenge for in the, in this global climate crisis, or uh, not use climate change, uh, we have these structures of legitimation like Bolsonaro who uh, in this past four years caused a lot of destruction and they actually, they actually had this idea of let's use the opportunities, create crisis and let the bulldozers go into the forest. They, would, they actually said that in a meeting. So let's put down as much as we can. So they played with the structures of signification and structures of domination. Domination, they, uh, we can, use an example, sort of the environmental agencies in Brazil, uh, they, would, they, they completely uh, cut down the resources, the allocative resources, the money. So there were no people any longer to, to find people who would forest. So they were controlling the agencies, but also signification, and this is key to allowing this to happen here. So people, uh, it's very symptomatic here. People get their piece of land, they build a house and they pave the whole area and no grass. It's like, let's not have trees here. So people are just blind, not only to the beauty of things, but also to the overall importance and the, and the importance of the place has in the world, okay? So uh, this is a presentation much more to share with you a little bit of the, the other side of the coin because we talk a lot about discourses, but then how does it, the, how does it feel to be riding the eye of the storm? Because uh, we, we have, uh, in everyday life here, we deal with that. For instance, I usually say, when I was a kid, I would sleep with blankets without air conditioning. There's no way today that I can sleep without air conditioning. And recently I said to friends, I've sent Christian several pictures of capybaras. And they're beautiful. And recently I said to friends, it's funny because when I was a kid, I mean, it was not common to see them. I went to you, you, the university here, so I had lots of capybara. And I said, I, I, when I studied at university, we didn't have capybara. And then said, someone told me, yes, but that's because we destroyed the forest and now they are actually living with us. They just walk in the streets more and more. So uh, it is urgent. So this is something that we need to think from a linguistic perspective. Uh, how we can contribute to this challenge because uh, before we we have this uh, material uh, damages, these things start in the immaterial realm, you know, with discourse naturalizing in the notion of development or 
how do you call Chris? Do you remember in Hong Kong, they call the building companies, I forgot now. Uh, there's development companies, right? Developers. Yes, the developers. Thank you, Lucky. Yeah, the developers are the people who destroy the land and they plant a huge building. So that's part of this course. So thank you very much for joining us and thank you to Chris Master and Lockie for putting this together. And we have a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you. Questions, comments. Now I'm trying to. I think there are some comments and questions yeah. in the in, in the chat. Uh, okay, box, now I can see. So. Yeah. yeah, you can see it now. Yeah. yeah, I think the first one was from uh, Valerie uh, at ten or oh three, right? Very early at the beginning. Yes. That's that's great. I lost it here because I couldn't see the the chat. Yes, just uh, thank you for that comment, uh, Valeria. Uh, I think the the, the uh, part of the context is uh, that this is happens to be well. I think the general point is that uh, stories for uh, kids. Uh, picture books read aloud or, uh, uh, you know, books that they will start reading when they are just getting into reading. I think they're very important. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it would be interesting to to have a study of this, uh, maybe it's been done already, uh, systemic functionally of, of, of books that deal with the environment. I was looking on my shelf, there's a recent book that does this with picture books for children precisely in terms of uh, gender and, and sex identity, uh, edited by A. Aventola and um, Jesus Moyano. Moyano? Um, yeah, it doesn't matter, but, but I, I was trying to find it myself. But in any case, uh, because I think these are very formative uh, and the sort of sense that uh, stories and uh, naturalize certain uh, certain uh, patterns. And so it's the patterns in the grammar that Michael talked about, uh, that we are the ones who can uh, act on trees. Uh, he points out that, of course, trees could also be construed as actors uh, producing oxygen, for example. Uh, and so if you have these traditional uh, stories that sort of reinforce the traditional grammar, uh, I think it's important to think about the role they play. Um, that that was the point of that. So, so uh, it seems to me then uh, it's it's it would be interesting to have a project. Maybe there is one already that uh, does precisely this with uh, picture books for children. Yes, uh, just to complement on Kristen's answer. I mean, this uh, the need for uh, projects. I think we, it would require and it would be good if we actually get to involve professionals from, for instance, forestry engineering. Here, I've been trying to get closer to these people who, who, who do sustainability, who work with forest management. So you can actually get to understand, he has a multimodal approach to challenging gender stereotypes in children's picture books. So yeah. yes, uh, this is actually, these initiatives are important because if, we need to, we should be able to understand more about not only the discourse practices but also the social practices understand what happens in the forest and and actually the challenges uh, recently Esther and I we were in a conference with Tom Barlett he organized uh, on communication and sustainability and we invited a forestry engineer to explain to us more about what sustainability is from their perspectives and the challenges in a place like this. Because it, 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 it's also about needs from people who live in the forest because we, the problem of romanticizing 
this this conversation is that uh, we talk about polar bears, but we don't talk about the people who live in the forest and actually who, people who actually depend on it. And they have made a choice to stay there. They don't want to have another way of living, but they still need uh, to make a living. So if we don't develop ways, uh, including, for example, developing new uh, undergrad programs that could teach people how to explore the forest with design and other types of knowledge. So it's really about turning uh, the place, uh, these places, because it's not only the case here, uh, to turn this to a more, uh, to think in terms of cultural industry. So it just, it's not just timber industry. So knowledge is essential in this, but we need to understand their needs uh, from the ground. So I hope that in the future I have an ausfall here. So let's see. <laughs> Please, yes. I mean, so, sadly, the picture is, is the same uh, around the world uh, with uh, the forestry, agriculture encroaching on uh, on on uh, very important uh, territories and the traditional lifestyles and it's been going on of course for a very long time centuries um so we we ought to have learned lessons <laughs> uh and uh, be able to deal with it uh, it it happened in in northern sweden in the 19th century the, the reindeer, nomadic reindeer herm, her, her, herders, the Samis, had had this vast territory to, to herd their reindeers and migrating with the seasons. Uh, and then the, uh, the farmers looked for more farmland, moved further north. And there was also the mining industry and the, the, the forest industry. So uh, they were gradually uh, lost territory and had to change their lifestyle. Uh, and again, Tourism came in as a, a support, right? That I think happens in many places. Uh, people lo lose their traditional modes of subsistence because they lose territory, etc., uh, and then they sell themselves through tourism instead. Yeah, uh, have to. I, I, yes. Uh, any other questions, comments? Thank you, Samia. <laughs> oh, that's good, Tom. Uh, just to reply to one last uh, comment from Valeria that she mentioned about Bolsonaro and religion, that is extremely important in the process of controlling narratives, the religious uh, aspect. Uh, this is something that uh, a while back some years ago uh, in a book called uh, Clash of Civilizations. Kristen, can you remind me, he, remember his name, uh, the author? It's Samuel, oh my God. So the Clash of, in Clash of Civilizations. Uh, oh, Huntington, Samuel Huntington, yes, 96. Yes, Samuel Huntington, yes. Uh, he, towards the end of the book, he talks about Latin America. This is a book that we all should read as Latin Americans, most of us here, because he mentions how in the new century, how religion would play a big role in South America, in Latin America in general. So, and actually it, it's, uh, we could even say in the Americas because Trump in the US is exploiting religion. So this is a very America. Thing. Well, if we look back to the history of America, uh, we have religion from the start here trying to save the indigenous people and killing everybody in, on, in the process. So, but that, that, that's a book that we should look into and bring to discussions. Uh, I've been planning to reread it now just to see how accurate he was of his uh analysis for the future but so far from what i can remember yes so bolsonaro does play the religious card so he he gets away with everything because his motto is 
Brazil above all of us and God above everything. And every time he ends a speech or something, he always delivers the, that motto every time. Yes, Christian, Samuel Huntington, The Clash of Civilizations. Uh, it's towards the end when he's rounding things up and he says, "What well, this is what's going to happen with Latin America. So I think it's worth it. So thank you very much. We are past the time and we really appreciate the opportunity. It's good to see some people I haven't seen in a long time, like uh, Christina Boccia and other people that I've seen around in other conferences. Good to see you again, Miriam, as well. So looking forward to meeting you in person soon. Thank you, all Christian, Esther, and Lockie for doing this. So, Lucia. Yes. Thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, so everybody. To, Thanks, Francisco. To going to Accra and to the return in person to Mendoza. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. We should all host you back here. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautiful. Nice to see you all. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Bye. Thank you. Lovely. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Another course meeting today. <laughs>